And I love. Today we're going to be talking about evolution part two. So, when we talk about natural selection, we said that there were there are a few ideas that went along with it, and adaptation is one of them. And one way that organisms can adapt is going to be through mimicry. Now, there's two types of mimicry where you actually wear the colors of another organism, and is called Batesian mimicry. And these are just look-alike. So this organism right here is not harmful in any way whatsoever, but it resembles this guy that is harmful. Now the other type of mimicry is called Malarian mimicry. And both of them are actually dangerous, and they look like each other. So again, this guy is dangerous. He can sting you as, long, as well as this one can sting you. So again, the difference between Batesian mimicry is Batesian, the mimic can't actually harm you. But he gets the benefit of wearing the colors that warn people off. Malarian, both can harm you. Okay, so warning colors. Again, there's lots of different warning colors found in nature. Some of them have blue and black stripes. Some of them have red stripes if you see orange on an insect or different color stripe patterns. That typically means to leave them alone. And a lot of times it signals to other organisms that they don't taste good. This is an anti-predator defense, and it's called aposematic coloration. Now, the world has changed. We used to be all one big continent known as Pangaea, and then as our plates divided, it took the continents with them and separated them. Now, this caused geographic isolation. Geographic, talking about geography, where you're found on the, on the planet. Isolation. This split up some organisms that used to live together and put them in separate and different portions of the world, even in different climates. So some evidence for evolution. We have five basic ideas. Paleontology is one of them. The examination of fossils and comparing them to modern day organisms and seeing the differences and the similarities between them. Now, again, when we actually dig down, we're taking a guess or an estimate to see where the uh, fossils actually lie and how old they are. We weren't there, so we don't actually know exactly when they existed, but through different sequences and different sands and different soils, we can take a guess about when they lived. Biogeography. Bio meaning life. Geography is where you're located. So the distribution of species. We notice that unrelated species in different regions of the world resemble one another in similar environments. Even if they had no ancestor at all that was common, if they were in similar environments, they developed similar traits and similar features. Next we have embryology. Embryology is going to be the study of the developmental stages in the womb or in embryo. And we look at the phylogeny or what they look like. And we have a lot of developmental similarities. Take a look at this. So, if I gave you all of these without naming what they were, you would not be able to tell me which one was the tortoise or which one was the rabbit or which one was the human. Because they look very similar young in the embryo. They have all have tails. They all have some sort of head and some bump region. Now, as they mature, we can start seeing some differences. And so with our fish and salamander, we can definitely tell that it's going to be different than, say, the human or the rabbit. But still, these animals look very similar to one another. And again, as they continue to develop, we notice that we still have similarities. You know, the humans lost the tail. But many of the other animals still have their tail and it just shrank down in. So embryology is a way that we can look and find similarities between organisms that we didn't think were similar at all. More evidence for evolution. Comparative anatomy. So we're comparing the anatomy of different organisms. Comparing anatomical structures to identify evolutionary relationships. To see how they re relate to one another. Homologous structures. Now, homo means the same. So we're going to have similar structures that may or may not do the same thing. Then we have analogous structures. They're different structures whatsoever, 
but they do the same thing. They have the same function. Finally, we have biochemistry. Looking at the DNA and studying the relationships between the DNA patterns and the base numbers and the similarity of the strands and the chromosome numbers. When we look at the comparative anatomy, we also see vestigial structures. These structures are inherited structures from ancestors, but that are no longer used today. In the naked mole rat, he is blind, but he still has vestigial eyes. Some snakes may actually have little legs, but they don't use those legs. They're vestigial. In humans, we have a tailbone, or the coccyx. Now, we don't have tails, but we still have this bone. For the ostrich, they have wings, but they don't fly. So again, it's a structure that we have inherited from our ancestors, but no longer used. Homologous structures. Again, homologous are going to be the same structures or similar structures, but they may or may not have the same function. So, if we look at the arm of a human, a cat, a whale, and a bat. Now, the human, we use it to reach out and grab things, and we typically start with one, and then we have two, and then we have some small bones, and then we have very distinct finger-like or thin bones. For the cat, they use it to actually walk on. But again, we have one bone, then two bones, then some small bones, and then finger-like bones. For the whale, again, it's one bone, two bones, this little bones, and finger-like bones. But the whale is going to be used as a fin. So it's not like the human in function-wise at all. And then if we look at the bat, the bat also has one bone, then two bones, then some little bones, then the finger-like bones. But this is their wing. This is how they actually fly. The homologous structures are the same structure, but may have different functions. Now, analogous structures is the exact opposite. They have the exact same function, but they may be different structures. So the wing of a moth, the wing of a bat, the wing of a bird. These are all analogous, even though they are created from completely different structures. They all do the same thing. They all help them fly. Mechanisms for evolution. Population genetics. Study of complex behaviors of genes in the population based upon the variation amongst populations and nature. So one of the big things in population genetics that you need to remember is who actually evolves? Does the individual evolve or does a population evolve? Hmm. Well, it's actually going to be the population. You need to make sure that you remember that the population evolves, not just one single individual. Now, for the gene pool, it's the summation of all the alleles in a population. If the allelic frequency does not change, then we're in genetic equilibrium, and we do not have evolution occurring. Now, disruptions of that genetic equilibrium initiates the process of evolution. So what can disrupt genetic equilibrium? Well, we have mutations such as radiation and chemicals, and even chance or randomness can cause a mutation in the gene. We also have genetic drift, where only certain members of a population can reproduce and pass on those traits. Allele frequencies become drastically different when only a portion of the population can reproduce. Finally, we have geographic isolation. If organisms are split up and put into different environments and put under different pressures, then only a certain percent of the population is going to be able to survive and have the beneficial trait. So, we'll see evolution there. Patterns of evolution. So, we see divergent evolution. A species which was once very similar becomes increasingly distinct and forms their own niche. This is what happened with Darwin's finches. They used to be very similar altogether, but then, as the pressures of only a certain amount of food was available, the beaks became specialized, so that each of these birds could survive on a special type of food. So again, the large beaks were able to crack the nuts, 
the thin beaks were able to get into and between the bark to get those juicy worms and bugs that lived inside the trees. We also see convergent evolution, or distantly related organisms that evolve similar traits. So, convergent, they're going to come in together. They're different species and different organisms, but they've been put into similar situations that they have evolved similar traits. So they converge. Now, another example of this would be the shark and the dolphin. Both of them have that dorsal fin because it is beneficial to have the dorsal fin. Now, sharks and dolphins are not related whatsoever, but they have similar traits because of the environment that they live in. Again, convergent evolution. Patterns of evolution, we see a normal allelic frequency. So in a population, you have your normal or your median, and that's what most of the individuals are going to be. And then you have your outliers, the extreme one way, so our really dark brown mouse, and the extreme the other way, the very light white mouse. Now, if we have a directional selection, that means it has pushed this bell curve either to one side or the other in a certain direction. So it was more beneficial to be dark brown than it was to be white. So our white mouse or our white mice ended up dying off and we saw a whole population shift to the darker side. Stabilizing selection. The extremes were eliminated and the center or middle group was actually selected for. Disruptive selection. The middle group was actually killed off. The majority of them and these outliers on either side were the ones left. Now this could, have, could actually happen if a virus or some disease came through and wiped out the majority of the population. But the extremes, those individuals that were the outliers that had differences, were able to survive. Finally, there's two ways that evolution can occur in a population. There's gradualism, where change is slow but steady, and you see it gradually change. And then there's punctuated equilibrium. In punctuated equilibrium, we have spurts of large changes. And then we keep on going on this one, and another large change. So it's punctuated. It is not a gradual thing. Well, that's what I've got for you today. Bye.